welcome to Stingray Toms Florida and another deeper dive into the archive. Today I'm looking at the origins of Kennedy Space Center, America's link to the universe. While it's commonly known by its initials, KSC, for the first 15 years it was simply the Cape. Kennedy Space Center. Aside from Florida's theme parks, it's the most visited attraction in the state. Over 1.5 million people visit KSC each year, and that's not counting the tens of thousands who flock to Cape Canaveral for each major launch. Essentially, KSC, in conjunction with Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, is America's space launch facility, with more than 90% of the country's manned and unmanned space launches occurring there. But why was the eastern shore of Florida selected? At that time, there wasn't even a paved road on the Cape, and it certainly wasn't near to any technological or engineering center. Well, to be honest, the reason is clear as a map of Florida. The country's missile testing had begun in New Mexico at the same location as the world's first nuclear explosion. But White Sands Missile Range ended up being too small to be safe for launching all but the smallest of rockets. Imagine that. Large enough for a nuclear bomb, too small for rockets. Now take a look at Florida. What's the defining feature on the Atlantic shore? For 12,000 years, that bulge you see was the home of the Sarek and Ice people. It was named Cabo Canaveral by Spanish explorers and is the third oldest surviving European place name in the continental United States after Florida itself and the dry Tortugas. Canaveral is Spanish for bed of reeds. So let's take a look at the early years of this unique part of Florida. From this sandy spot we've sent spacecraft outward bound that have left our solar system and sent 12 humans to walk on the moon. President John F. Kennedy would deliver two speeches in which he announced the initiative to send Americans to the moon. This wasn't his administration's idea, however. When Dwight Eisenhower was president, the concept of the Apollo program, including the goal of humans landing on the moon, was first suggested. The inevitable government feasibility study was conducted between July 1960 and May 1961. Kennedy replaced Eisenhower in 1961, and based on that study, he announced in an address to Congress the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. He gave the second speech at Rice University a year and a half later. Rice University, which is located in Houston, Texas, was chosen because it assisted in a transfer of land between Humble Oil Company and NASA. That land would be used for the Manned Spacecraft Center, today known as the President Lyndon Johnson Spacecraft Center. It's better known as Mission Control, and it handled all astronaut training and managed every NASA human spaceflight between 1965 and 2011. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. At this point, I'm really putting the rocket before the nose cone, as it were. Project Apollo would take Americans to the moon, but that's at the end of today's story. Hopefully that's not a spoiler. The history of the Cape's connection with space began many years before. In fact, it starts before Eisenhower's feasibility study. In 1949, our story's fourth president, this time Harry Truman, established the joint long-range proving ground at Cape Canaveral. This made the Cape an official test site for missiles and rockets of all sorts, military, civilian, and commercial. Easily one of the quietest places on the Atlantic coast, the Cape quickly began buzzing with hundreds of engineers, construction workers, scientists, and soldiers. 
By the summer of 1950, makeshift facilities were in place to begin the first launches. As mentioned, the Cape was uniquely suited to the task of these early launches. Yet another study had suggested the Cape would be optimal. There were several reasons. Its location reduced the chance that populated areas would be endangered by the missiles by ensuring that they'd be safely over the ocean immediately after launch. It was located nearer the equator. Rockets launched from the Cape take advantage of the rotational speed of the Earth, which is greatest at the equator. The position requires less thrust and less fuel than other parts of the U.S. After the war, there were many inactive military bases in the state, and it happened that one of them was just south of the Cape. That base would be reactivated as support for the launching site since it already had runways and buildings. Today, the base is Patrick Space Force Base, and it continues to control and operate Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. But the main reason that the Cape seemed an ideal place for rocket tests is often overlooked. There's a long row of islands that run in a line to the southwest, away from the Cape. Beginning with the nearby Bahamas, these islands extend 5,000 miles or 8,000 kilometers to extremely remote Ascension Island. The U.S. would build stations to track the missiles and receive telemetry signals about their flights on several of these islands. Known as the Eastern Range, it'd be vital for the early launches that were short and medium-range missiles that were primarily developed for nuclear warhead delivery, as these could be tracked with every measuring device possible. Later, it would also play a role when it came to the Mercury and Gemini programs. For these, they not only collected telemetry, but enabled the astronauts to stay in touch with mission control throughout their flights. Operating out of Patrick Air Force Base, the Eastern Range would be under the management of Pan American Airways Guided Missile Range Division, which was part of Pan American World Airways, the largest international air carrier in the world. Beginning in 1953, Pan Am would develop, operate, and maintain over a dozen sites on these islands. In turn, Pan Am contracted the Radio Corporation of America, better known as RCA, to operate and maintain the electronic equipment, radar stations, and tracking ships. Staff who worked in the remote locations would fly on Air Force planes from the Cape, not Pan Am's. In the 50s, it'd take three days to reach Ascension Island. Not all the scientists who would head to the Cape were American. Only five years after the end of World War II, rocketry was still in its infancy, having emerged from the war as one of two remarkable achievements. The other, you might guess, was the harnessing of nuclear power. During the war, it was the U.S. that developed the first atomic bombs, while it was Germany that focused on rockets. Yet the intriguing thing is that German-born scientists and engineers were both part of the team that developed America's nuclear weapons, as well as the team who kick-started our missile industry. There was one big difference between the two, however. While the Germans responsible for developing the first long-range rockets came to the U.S. after the war, those that helped develop the atomic bomb had left Germany and the parts of Europe which had been invaded doing so before the war. These individuals, shown mostly in their identification photos for the Manhattan Project, left Europe in the 1930s because of the rise of Adolf Hitler. On the other hand, those Germans who worked on the missiles did so under the control of Hitler and his regime, and it wouldn't be until the surrender of Germany that they'd end up in the U.S. They were just a part of a program known as Operation Paperclip that placed 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians in the employ of the U.S. government, often in secret and influential programs, including, of course, our space program. Werner von Braun, seen here in news clips in the early 1960s at the Cape, would go from being the director of the German Army Rocket Center to director of the Operations Division of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency and later director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. As a young man, von Braun launched small rockets with other enthusiasts at an abandoned ammunition dump in Berlin. 
The German army took note of the experiments as well as his managing of the group, and it wasn't long before he became a civilian specialist with the army. They would eventually develop the V-1 and V-2 missiles. The V-2 was the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile, known as vengeance weapons. Hitler wanted it in order to bombard Allied cities as retaliation for the bombings of German cities. Becoming operational in 1944, more than 3,200 V-2s were launched in the final eight months of the European War. They were targeted at cities primarily in England and Belgium. While about 9,000 people, mostly civilians, were killed in the attacks, the program is considered a sad failure as each one cost the 2023 equivalent of $1.4 million, yet didn't disable any significant military targets. Not only was the German rocket program a bust, some 20,000 laborers and Nazi concentration camp prisoners died as a result of their forced participation with the production of the weapons. The V-2 was von Braun's design, and while it is a remarkable invention, his role beyond designing the V-2 is a dark story. In 1958, Time magazine noted that to some, Von Braun's transfer of loyalty from Nazi Germany to the U.S. seemed to come too fast, too easy. In the 21st century, his life can be viewed without being overshadowed by his significant work for the U.S. As director of Nazi Germany's rocket program, he knew that the targets were civilian, and he knew that they were being built by starving slaves. Yes, it would have been dangerous for him to complain to Nazi leadership about his work or the conditions in which his missiles were made, but as Wayne Biddle, journalist and author of Dark Side of the Moon, suggested, one always has a choice in life, and von Braun never made a choice that moved him away from the Nazi regime. While a hero in the U.S., yet probably a German war criminal, Biddle, like others, had the opinion that von Braun was less of a Nazi idealist and more of an opportunist. His dream was to build rockets that took people to space, and it's apparent that he didn't really care who gave them the opportunity to do that. His remarkable transformation and the U.S. government's sanitization of his background is apparent in Walt Disney's 1955 television special, Man in Space. Created by the Disney team for television, Von Braun is the star of the show. Dr. Werner Von Braun, who is at present the chief of the guided missile division of the Army's Rocket Center at Redstone Arsenal. He was also overall director of the development of the original V-2 rocket. Now here's a model, my design for a four-stage orbital rocket ship. Compared to the unmanned instrument rocket, it is quite large, but the overall size and weight of the rocket is mainly determined by the 11 tons weight of this top section. This weight dictates the amount of fuel and the numbers of motors needed to produce enough power to equalize the gravitational pull of the Earth. The payload in the top section will consist of 10 crew members plus equipment. Notice the wings, small rocket motor, and landing gears. This is a section that must ultimately return the men to the Earth safely. Walt Disney took a keen interest in the early American space program and embraced it by not only producing that TV show, but taking tours of NASA facilities as well as putting futuristic space elements in Disneyland, his cutting-edge theme park that would open the same year as Man in Space aired. While von Braun is the best known of the German rocketeers, there were others of importance who transitioned from the German army to the U.S. Army and eventually to NASA. Among them were Karl Heimberg. Heimberg would be selected by von Braun to serve as the initial director of the test division at the Marshall Space Flight Center. During the war, he was assigned to the Pinamunda Army Research Center and worked on testing V-2 engines. Hubertus Strughold Strughold was a medical doctor. From 1935 to 1945, he served as the chief of medical research for the Ministry of Aviation, led by Hermann Goering. 
It's alleged that he took part in medical experiments on prisoners at Dachau concentration camp, where inmates were immersed in freezing water, subjected to low air pressure, forced to drink seawater, and endure surgery without anesthetic. These activities became more widely known following the release of U.S. Army documents that listed Strughold among those being sought as war criminals. Once brought to the U.S., he served with the Air Force and NASA in the study of physical and psychological effects of spaceflight. He would become chief scientist of NASA's medical division and was instrumental in developing spacesuits and life support systems, becoming known as the father of space medicine. In light of the Army intelligence documents, most of Strughold's honors have been revoked. Heinz Haber Haber trained as a fighter pilot and flew reconnaissance for the Luftwaffe until he was shot down in 1942. Witness testimonies portray Haber as an avid supporter of Hitler. After the war, he'd become a researcher at the U.S. Air Force School of Aviation Medicine. For several years, he worked with Hubertus Strughold on the physiological effects of low pressures, sometimes using the unethical research done at Dachau. In the 1950s, he became the chief scientific consultant to Walt Disney Productions and co-hosted Man in Space with Von Braun. Kurt Heinrich Debus Debus held a doctorate in engineering. Prior to World War II, he was a member of the Nazi Party and joined the SA in 1933 and the SS in 1940, both major paramilitary organizations under Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party. During the war, he served as a flight test director for the V-2. Appointed directly by Hitler, he was actively engaged in the rocket research program. In the U.S., from 1952 to 1962, he headed the development and construction of rocket launch facilities at the Cape. From 62 to 74, he was the first director of the Kennedy Space Center. By the way, Davis had a noticeable scar on his left cheek. He received it while attending university. While there, he became a member of an elite dueling fraternity. The tradition of German fencing fraternities had existed since the 17th century, and dueling scars were considered marks of high honor among German military officers, sometimes referred to as bragging scars. In the Disney show, von Braun was cheerful and engaging, and with the exception of the astronauts, he became space's most popular poster boy. His demeanor was perhaps surprising, but von Braun was known to be a singularly goal-focused person. To meet his goal, he offered Hitler the promise of a vengeance weapon. At the end of the war, he deliberately surrendered himself along with his team to American forces. And to the American public, he sold the dream of men in space and flags on the moon for democracy. On July 24, 1950, Bumper, a modified V-2, became the first rocket to be fired from the Cape. With this successful launch, a new era in rocketry began. They mated this old warhorse V-2 out of Peenemunde, Germany. With this small young missile called the WAC Corporal, fresh out of Pasadena, California. The V-2 WAC Corporal combination was America's first two-stage missile. It also marked, for the first time, the blending in action of American and German rocket brains. To start, the Army constructed the service tower for bumper out of paint scaffolding bought in Orlando, possibly the city's first contribution of many to the space program. The tower was pushed by hand up to the rocket. An average telephone pole was used as the stand for the umbilical, and for when the umbilical disconnected during the launch, basic army mattresses were positioned so that the hardware could fall safely and be reused. Bumper number seven was to be the first launch from the Cape. However, the rocket misfired. As a result, bumper number eight became the first. Bumper seven followed a few days later. The first years at the Cape 
were for missile testing primarily, with 789 launches in the 50s, representing 25% of all CAPE launches between 1950 and 1999. There were hardly any typical launches, as the military and NASA were experimenting with many different types of rockets, such as this Navajo, a supersonic intercontinental cruise missile built by North American Aviation, which never entered service. With crewed missions taking the lead in the early 1960s, the decade would see over 1,100 launches, culminating with the Apollo 11 launch that would see two Americans walk on the moon. By 1969, the Cape would have completed 60% of the launches in the 20th century. At Cape Canaveral, the 51st launching of an Atlas intercontinental missile carrying a half-ton payload of research instruments the Atlas, shown in these Defense Department films, soars downrange a full 9,000 statute miles. Its target, a point in the southern reaches of the Indian Ocean. The longest surface-to-surface -surface rocket shot ever achieved. NASA and the Cape were the domain of men in the 50s and 60s. At least that's been the impression of most people for 70 years. Recently, however, historians have been digging deeper into NASA's past, and while men certainly held the most significant positions, there were quite a few women practicing highly valuable work in the early days of space exploration. Not only did a number of pioneering women contribute to NASA, they helped to pave the way for other women to progress into some of the leadership roles. As an example, two of the earliest were Margaret Hamilton, Hamilton is a computer scientist and systems engineer who was the first programmer hired for the Apollo project and in 1965 became director of the software engineering division. She managed the team responsible for writing and testing flight software for the Apollo program's command and lunar modules as well as the Skylab space station. During Neil Armstrong's lunar landing, it was the software she developed that averted an aborted landing. While alarms sounded because the computer was overloaded with interrupts, the software was able to prioritize tasks and reestablish the important ones over those of lower priority. Armstrong was able to safely land. Among her numerous awards, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama in 2016, the highest civilian honor in the U.S. Francis Northcutt Better known as Poppy, Northcutt is an engineer and attorney. In 1965, she began working for TRW, who contracted with NASA to take raw telemetry data and convert it for further study. Within six months, she would be promoted to do direct engineering work. She was the first woman to work as technical staff. She would help create the return to Earth trajectory for the Apollo 8 crew from the moon back to Earth. In working with that mission, she became the first female engineer to work in mission control. Later, she helped develop the programming to allow the disabled Apollo 13 to return home safely. President Nixon awarded Northcutt the Presidential Medal of Freedom as part of the Houston-based Apollo 13 mission operations team after Apollo 13 was safely home. Northcutt and Hamilton weren't the first notables, however. I want to highlight one who gained some national notoriety in 1959. This is Helen Mann. She worked for RCA, the subcontractor that provided the technical functions of operating and maintaining the range instrumentation systems. This included missile flight data processing, tracking instrumentation, and communication links between the launch sites and downrange tracking stations. RCA, like NASA, hired women as computers. The term in the 1950s was a job description, not an electronic device. Human computers undertook calculations necessary to complete the research reports. They performed thousands of mathematical calculations by slide rule or with mechanical calculators, such as this Frieden calculating machine pictured here. Poppy Northcutt began as a computer, as did Helen Mann. 
Hidden Figures, a book by Margot Lee Shetterly, told the story of black women who worked as human computers at NASA. It was made into a movie in 2016. Computing was thought of as a menial work at the time, and though their work was vital, it wasn't treated that way. Though it required a college degree, and the pay was better than nearly all other jobs women could hold, it was a way to use their degrees in the hard sciences in professions formerly close to them. Even so, they still found their careers limited. That being said, a few used the computer position as a stepping stone for other positions in NASA. For instance, Mann would become the Chief Missile Flight Data Analyst at RCA. She held two master's degrees in physics and prepared test data for the Air Force and NASA as well as tracking the location of missiles in the Eastern Range. She worked directly with Patrick Air Force Base's Florida Automatic Computer, better known as FLAC, an early digital electronic computer. Flack's computation supported the flight tests of ballistic and cruise missiles such as the Redstone, Snark, Navajo, and Atlas. Mann's 15 minutes of fame would occur because of her interesting position, but not surprisingly, also because of her looks. On February 15, 1959, Mann appeared on the popular quiz show What's My Line? Ed Coturba, a syndicated columnist, noted, who had ever seen a scientist in a tight-fitting cocktail dress before? What's my line? <laughs> Helen P. Man. And now, uh, do you know how we keep score on this program? Yes, I do, John. All right, fine. Then let's let everybody in the audience here in the theater and the folks who are at home know exactly what your line is, shall we? <laughs> Mrs. Mann. Mrs. Mann. <laughs> If ever a girl had the wrong name. <laughs> do your customers, if I may call them customers, do they uh, derive some um, physical or mental uh, benefit after you have uh, seen them? <laughs> <laughs> this man says she's lost. I'm not. You'll get a no. That's six no. down and four to go, Miss Preston. Am I right in thinking that in view of your suntan that you don't do your work in Boston? True. Uh, do you acquire your sunburn in the course of your work? No. Eight. Actually, this is going to surprise you. Mrs. Mann tracks missiles at Cape Canaveral. <laughs> works for the Radio Corporation of America, which under contract has a missile tracking unit at Cape Canaveral, as Pan American, for instance, is the housekeeping unit they at get Cape it Canaveral. Everywhere. That's yes, true. indeed. Yeah. And isn't it wonderful? Uh, I must say that Mrs. Mann holds a, a, an AB and also, I believe, a master's degree That's in right. science and is, is a fine scientist in, on top of being a very beautiful young lady. Thank you, John. I wish we had more scientists. I mean, uh, well. Uh, <laughs> As you can see, the panelists failed to guess her occupation and were quite taken by her beauty. Coturba would write that man looked more like a model than a lady just off the launching pad. This gal is 5 feet 5, 27, and smiles softly from a heart-shaped face that melts into long, flowing locks of platinum. Of course, that's the progress of women in the 1950s in a nutshell. It was perfectly appropriate to be surprised that someone so attractive could possibly be intelligent. Around the same time, Mann would be featured in a magazine ad for R.C. Cola, extending her 15 minutes a bit longer. She also expressed a desire to be, as she put it, a lady astronaut. <laughs> 
explaining that women had more patience than men and a person needs a lot of patience in space science research. As you may know, humans weren't the first living things to be launched by rockets. In fact, fruit flies were the first to study the effects of radiation. Eventually, primates would be sent up as precursors to humans. Ham would be the first astrochimp in 1961, paving the way for Alan Shepard, America's first human in space. Shepard was one of the Mercury 7, the first Americans chosen to be astronauts. While he was the first American in space, he was also arguably the funniest. For example, when reporters asked what he was thinking about as he sat atop the rocket, Shepard replied, The fact that every part of the ship was built by the lowest bidder. Years later, when he flew on Apollo 14 and was on the moon, he used a Wilson six-iron head attached to a lunar sample scoop handle to hit a couple golf balls. After whacking the second ball, he announced that it went for miles and miles and miles. Later analysis of the film showed that he hit it only 120 feet, or 37 meters. As Shepard walked out to the rocket, he looked up at the 83-foot-tall vehicle. The liquid oxygen was venting, and there were searchlights everywhere. He would say, well, I'm not going to see this redstone again. And it was sort of like reaching out and kicking the tires on the redstone. Because I stopped and looked at it, you know, to look back and and up uh, at this beautiful rocket and uh, thought, well, okay, Buster, let's go and get the job done. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off. Lift off. Launch is okay. 365,000. Roger, 2G. The next flight was by Enos, our second space chimp. He was the only chimpanzee to reach orbit when he flew two orbits on the Mercury Atlas rocket. Both Enos and Ham had been trained to pull levers to receive rewards of banana pellets and avoid electric shocks. Unlike the Soviet cosmonauts, America's astronauts were able to have some control over the capsule during flight, and the chimpanzees showed it was possible. As scientists and technicians prepare to orbit Enos, a five-year-old chimpanzee around the Earth, this is the preliminary, all-important step in space research that the U.S. insists on being successful before a man makes an orbital flight. Part of a highly trained team of chimps, Enos has been taught to perform certain tasks aboard the capsule when lights flash. His reward, a banana-flavored tidbit. The flight is delayed almost until the deadline. But now the countdown approaches zero and last off. History in the making. Scientists are elated at the condition of both chimp and capsule. They came through the test in a manner that brings a manned flight closer to reality for the U.S. space team. Take a look at this photo inside the Saturn Control Center at the Cape. While you may notice President Kennedy and Werner von Braun sitting there, look directly above their heads. See those three objects that descend from the ceiling? Any guesses on their purpose? Would it help if I told you that they can drop down to eye level? Dr. Friedrich Kohlmorgen was born in Prussia in 1871, the same year Prussia joined the German Empire. He immigrated to America in 1905. Kohlmorgen would go on to found an optics company in 1916 that, among other products, developed a series of periscopes that were used extensively by the U.S. Navy in its submarines. In the 1950s, Cole Morgan would begin working with the Air Force and NASA, a relationship that would last for six decades. One of its interesting contributions were periscopes that were retooled and rebranded bunker scopes that were used to safely view launches from only hundreds of feet away. Cole Morgan described them as requiring 
virtually no maintenance and built to withstand blast forces as may be expected around missile launching sites. They allowed observers to see exact details, particularly for static tests, with magnification and in true color and were adapted to photography and video use. Beginning with Project Gemini, Cole Morgan also provided inertial guidance systems for the rockets, developing them for Gemini, Saturn, Apollo, and Titan programs. In the mid-1970s, NASA's Viking spacecraft contained Cole Morgan gearless torque motors. Beginning in the 1980s, they were also involved in critical applications on every space shuttle mission. Speaking of President Kennedy, let's look at another part of his speech at Rice University that succinctly describes Project Apollo. We shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth Re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. The President would tour the Cape in late 1963, more than a year after his first visit that included Vice President Lyndon Johnson. In this visit, he'd be shown how the development for Project Apollo was coming along, looking at launch complexes and the new launch control center. Kennedy would also take a helicopter offshore to witness a Polaris missile launch from the USS Andrew Jackson, a nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine. President Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963, just six days after that visit to the Cape. While his death was keenly felt throughout the United States, it really shook the people working on his lunar goal. They were more than three years away from the first planned Apollo-Saturn launch with a crew. Some even feared that the loss of Kennedy would mean some major changes for the project. But seven days later, newly sworn in President Lyndon Johnson, with his second executive order, designated NASA's Launch Operations Center as the John F. Kennedy Space Center. Also in 1963, NASA negotiated land use agreements to expand while the National Wildlife Service was authorized to administer the land NASA wouldn't need. This led to the 63 creation of Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. In 75, Canaveral National Seashore, located just north and east of Kennedy Space Center, was established as well. As of 2023, you can see the combined area of Merritt Island NWA and KSC, as well as that of Canaveral Seashore and Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, which is actually the location that I've been talking about all along. Note that the actual area of Canaveral Station is 10 times the size that Wikipedia states. As useful as Wikipedia is, please don't automatically trust what you read there. By 1964, the Cape was developing into the world's first moon port. Now known as Kennedy Space Center, it'd be called KSC by the new arrivals, and while KSC would become one of the most important facilities in the U.S. and grow to be a very popular tourist destination, its early name, the Cape, would mostly fade away. Thank you once again for watching another of my videos. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Toms, Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.